appreciate everybody that's been a part of this service this morning. I've really enjoyed this, uh, the children and, and the seniors. Uh, still looking for that dance from the seniors, though. <laughs> it's not going to happen, is it? Well, this morning's message is the next generation, and obviously because we're in a generational service, I figured that'd be a good message to preach on. Amen? Would you please stand with me as we read from the Word of the Lord? We're in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 18 through 21. Deuteronomy 11, verses 18 through 21. If you have your Bibles, feel free to follow along, or you can just look at the screen up top. And the Word of the Lord says, Therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall write them on the doorposts of the houses and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them like the days of the heavens above the earth. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your many promises, and we're asking for your continued guidance and direction. Father, I thank you for the youngest to the oldest that are serving you. And we pray for those that don't yet know Jesus, that they too would come into the kingdom, that today would be the day of salvation. And Father, use us for your glory. We pray for those laborers to go out into the harvest. And while we pray that, we are willing as well to be those laborers. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Go ahead and smile at somebody as you have a seat this morning. There was a little girl, and she cried out. She said, Mommy, you know that vase in the china cabinet, the one that's been handed down from generation to generation? And she said, yes, dear, I know which one you mean. What about it? And the little girl said, well, Mommy... I'm sorry, but this generation just dropped it. <laughs> you know, some earthly possessions have sentimental value. And to break them is a great loss, but how much more tragic it would be for a new generation to drop it spiritually, to fail to pass along the godly heritage they have received, that would be an eternal loss. And this morning we're digging into the importance of training up the next generation. We're going to be looking at four different areas and obligations. Uh, those are our obligation to ourselves, our obligation to our children, our obligation to the Lord, and our, I'm sorry, to the world, and our obligation to the Lord. So let's dive right in this morning and jump right into our obligation to ourselves. Deuteronomy 11:18. we just read it, says, Therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul and bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And I had to look up what frontlets were. I don't know about you, but that's not a word in my, de- my, my vocabulary. Uh, if, is anybody here just normally just walk around and say, hey, that's nice frontlets? <laughs> uh, me neither. Okay, frontlets are actually something that you wear on the front. It's that, hence the name frontlets. It's uh, like a decoration and sometimes you'll see them as headpieces and whatnot. But that's what we're talking about this, this morning is frontlets on the, on the front of our head there. So we're going to jump into the basics here, back to the basics. So how do we lay up words in our hearts? Well, we can see biblically that in the Bible, that would be biblically, that we lay up the way of the heart is through the eyes and the ears. And this is the way that the Lord created each and every one of us. Every single one of us have this way in our heart. And anyone that says that they can watch or listen to anything and it won't affect them is lying to themselves. I don't care how long you've known the Lord or how close your walk is with the Lord, if you think that you can watch and listen to just anything, you're lying to yourself. Because the way into the heart is through the eyes and the ears. That's the way God has designed us. We take things to heart through our eyes and ears. And we're going to test this out this morning just to show to you how well this really works. I'm going to start a sentence from a movie or a line from a lyric of a song or whatever, and and you're going to finish it. Are you ready? And I'll even give you where this first one comes from. The first one comes from one of my absolute favorite movies, The Princess Bride. Okay, so I I see a lot of you smiling already. But it goes like this, and I want you to finish the rest of it. I'll stop in the middle. Marriage. Marriage is what? That's right. That's right. I'm going to start singing this next line from an old TV show. It goes like this. Just them good old boys. There you go, never meaning no harm. And we'll finish with this last one here. This comes from, well, I'll just, I'll just say it. Space, the final frontier. These are the... You got it. 
how is it? How is it that I can say half of a line and you can say the rest of it to me? How is this? How are these lines of lyrics? And some of them you probably haven't heard in years. When was the last time you actually watched an episode of the Duke Boys, the Dukes of Hazards? Then some of you go, eh, no. Dude, I was like this big when I watched the Dukes of Hazards. Okay. No, or the last time you got to watch a cool episode of Star Trek? Just yesterday. <laughs> oh, oh, blasphemy. <laughs> Uh, but we we know these things they're in our hearts how are they get there they get there through our eyes and ears they are committed to memory they've dropped down into our hearts and they got there through repetition they got there through the process of looking forward to what was going to happen in your favorite tv show or movie and it was a and there's also a willingness to hear them over and over again right If you weren't willing to hear them over and over again, you wouldn't put them to memory. You'd be like, I don't want to hear this again. I'm tired of this. Well, we can commit the word of God to our hearts if we're willing. If we're willing. When I spend time with the Lord or when we spend time with the Lord, we we can receive uh, instructions from him. And I know, and I'm sure you do the same, but I look forward to those moments. They're teachable moments when the Lord is teaching me something from his word. And I make visual notes in my Bible. And what this does is this helps with my eye gates. Amen? That, these are gates. That's what I call those. And my eye gates. And I read verses or, or, a verse or verses out loud to myself, which goes in my ears. And ultimately, that drops down into the heart, does it not? And, and, and that's how we commit verses to memory. That's how we commit God's word to our heart, how we put those things in there. But we have to be willing to do those things. Um, when we commit God's word to our heart, it keeps us on his paths of righteousness. I have a scripture verse written down in my office right now. I'm still in the process of, of memorizing. It says, Hebrews 2.1, Therefore, we must give a, a more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Did you catch that? We must give a more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. If we're not willing to heed those things, if we're not willing to put them into practice, then ultimately what's going to happen? You're going to drift away from those things. If our hearts are, are trained and filled, uh, and filled through our eyes and ears, is it possible then that we should guard them? Is it possible then we should guard them? I want to see and, and show you what the Lord's Word says on this subject. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 27 says this, My son, give attention to my words, Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not that let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Now, what? before we go any further in this, what two things have been mentioned so far? A few things have been mentioned so far. Your, the eyes, right? And the heart, right? And so we're not going to, we're going to keep them in the midst of, to, and incline your ear to my sayings as well. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. So what does guarding our hearts look like? Well, you can see through this passage what the, the, uh, the, the, pro- the, the almost proverb, the, the guy that wrote this, what he's trying to say. And what I'm trying to say is to guard our hearts with all diligence. We need to guard what goes in our eyes and our ears because it drops down into our hearts. And it, it looks like, guarding a heart looks like not letting anything into our heart that is displeasing to the Lord. Now, if you can honestly say, yes, Jesus would watch or listen to this, then okay, then that's fine. No matter how young or old you are, this truth applies to every single one of us, from the youngest to the oldest. As a matter of fact, I believe it's Proverbs tells us, it says, train up a child in the way that they should go, so when they're old, they won't what? Depart from it. So how are you going to train them up? You train them up through instruction, through, through teaching them. It's just like when you're teaching a child their ABCs. Um, somebody was telling me this past week that their mom used to make them lay out the cards in front of them when they were learning their ABCs. And, and when they got done, they were like, look, I got it. And the mom's like, great. And they would take up all those cards and shuffle them again and hand them back to them and say, do it again. <laughs> but that's how we learn. We learn through repetition, right? It's the same way with God's word and, and learning his word. Um, a lot of times we think, uh, it, it's easy to think, I can, I can handle this, I can do whatever, and then realize later that things do affect us when they, we let them in. 
So be diligent to guard your heart, for out of it your mouth speaks. And we know, we've talked about this before, that when, when you're under pressure, what's in the heart is going to come out your mouth, right? And, and uh, you, when, when you squeeze the stomach, if you squeeze it hard enough, whatever's on the inside comes out because of what you ate, right? Um, it may smell like dead cat or whatever. It just comes right out of the mouth. So you just get these things that, that happen. The Lord commanded the Israelites to lay up his words in their hearts and souls. And you know, if it was good for them, it's probably good for us as well. Amen? He told them to bind his words to their hands as a sign. And this is a reference to keeping his words before them or before us even. You know the saying, and I'm sure you've used it before, I have. I know this place like the back of my hand. That's right. The Lord wants us to know his word like the back of our hand. Because you could put all the hands down and look, you'd be like, that one's my hand. You could, not that you would cut it off, but if you were to lay hands up. If you could somehow, take a picture, there we go. Of all different, a bunch of different hands, you could pick your hand out of a picture of, let's say, 10 or 20. Right? You'd definitely know if it was yours, if it was missing. Um... The reason he wants us to know, know his word like the back of our hands is so that we know when something comes up that doesn't line up with the word. A flag comes up on the inside of us, and this also, also goes to being led by the Holy Spirit. As believers, we must be led by his precious spirit. We need to be led by his spirit. That way, when something that's coming in and it doesn't line up with the word of God, we can catch those red flags and say, something's not right here. I need to study this out and find out what's going on. So we need the precious Holy Spirit in our lives to uh, keep us uh, in, on track with him, with the Lord. If we know his word like the back of our hands, then we can be guided by his desires and his delights as well. We have an obligation to ourselves to learn God's word and put it into our hearts. And it won't get there by accident. It's not going to get there by laying on, on a Bible at night and trying to get it to absorb by osmosis. And the reason I say that is because when I was in the fifth grade, our, one of my teachers was telling me she knew of a man that could sleep on books and the information would go into his head while he was sleeping. Yeah, I tried it. Um, but that's all hogwash. You've got to study. It's got to come in through your eyes and ears and drop down in your heart. You have to place it there on purpose. If your only time of getting and learning the Bible is Sunday morning worship service, then you're not being diligent in getting the word in your heart. You're starving. You're starving spiritually. And I want to encourage you to feast on the word of God every single day of your life. Learn his ways. Learn his precepts. Be diligent in preparing your heart for eternity. Listen, when this earth suit passes away, we're going to step right into the next life. It's, there is no blackness of night or, or, or waiting period. It's just you step out of this body and into eternity. Okay, and that eternity is going to be one of two places. And I pray that you've made the preparations now to make heaven your eternity, heaven your home. Heaven, I want to clarify here too. We, we've been doing a lot of study about heaven. Heaven is not us sitting around on clouds strumming harps for eternity. That would be the most boring thing in my book. Amen? How many in here would be really disappointed if you got to heaven and that's all you had to do? Sit on this. I, I'd be like, this is not right. God, you did not design me to sit on a cloud and strum a harp for eternity. No, heaven is so much more than strumming a harp. Now, does that mean we won't play harps? I have no idea. But I got, I, there is going to be instruments in heaven. So those of you that love music and love to play, glory to God, there is an instruments or instruments waiting on you in heaven where we can worship the Lord together. Amen? Those of you that love to play the trombone can play the trombone in heaven or the baritone, the violin, the piano, whatever. Even the screeching seagulls will have a place in heaven. Uh, the, the, uh, clarinet players, just in case if you didn't know. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm sorry, Mom. I love you. <laughs> and it's more than just instruments, too, for those of you that well, we, you love fellowship. How many don't love fellowship? And we love fellowship with one another. Can you imagine a place with perfect fellowship? These are things we're preparing for here on this earth. It's going to be awesome. To be reunited with loved ones that knew Jesus Christ as Savior. We will see them again. We are not stuck here without them forever, but we will see them again. And also to be in the presence of the Lord, to see him as he is. Oh, that's giving me Holy Ghost goosebumps right now just thinking about it. That's exciting. So we need to be prepared and, and diligently preparing our hearts for eternity, which leads us to our next step, our obligation to our children. Now you may be saying, well, I don't have kids. Well, Oh, we're getting there, okay? Hang on. Whether you have natural-born children, whether you have adopted children, or no children, 
as born again believers, we should have babies. And here's what I mean. That means that as we mature in the faith, we should ultimately bring people to Jesus Christ to birth them into the kingdom and to disciple them and to nurture them as a, as a mother or father does to a child. Every single believer has that. And those of you that are too old to have any children or cannot have children, you can have spiritual children. You are never too old to have children in the kingdom. Let me tell you when you can quit having children in the kingdom. That's when you actually step through those pearly gates. When you've left this body, it, game over, you're done making babies. Amen? But until the time comes when you expire, you are not allowed to retire from making those spiritual babies. That means learning the word of God. That means uh, purposely reaching out to people. That means purposely making time to spend with them. It's very easy for us to get all wrapped up in our daily lives and to get so busy. We are so busy now as Americans. It's craziness. But if we could take a step back and say, Lord, I'm going to be led by your spirit today. I purposely want to be used by you to minister to somebody. Send them across my path. Now, if we pray that prayer, he will be true and honor that prayer. That's a good prayer to the Lord. He loves prayers like that. Well, how can you say that, Pastor Jason? Because we're like this, and I just know that's according to his word. Amen? His word talks about how we're to minister to the lost. We want to spend time with him. We're never too old to have children in the kingdom. The only barren wombs in the kingdom of God are ones that refuse to be intimate with the Lord and to do his will to tell others about Jesus. When we spend time with the Lord through prayer and study of his word, we're being intimate with him. And from those moments, we can go out and birth new believers into the kingdom of God. We can pray them into the kingdom. They need to be cared. Or they need someone to care for them. They need someone to love them. And they need someone to bring them in. Luke 10, 2 and 3, I know you're familiar with this passage. Jesus said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out, send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. There's a word picture for you. That'll bless you. I'm sending you out as lambs among... Have you ever seen a lamb among wolves? Do you realize what Jesus is saying here? Listen, if somebody promised you a better life when you become a Christian and they promise you fluffy clouds and ho-hos and ding-dongs or whatever... Jesus said himself that it'll be full of trials, temptations, and tribulations. And then he said, I'm going to send you out as a lamb among wolves, plural. That's more than one wolf. Wolves are not very friendly to lambs. There's a word, lamb chop, lamb steak, lamb soup. Wolves like that kind of stuff. Well, they don't make lamb soup, I know that. But, but what I'm saying though is that Jesus is saying he's sending us out as, as lambs among wolves. But I also want you to notice something else. Did you notice who he sent? He sent the ones that asked the Lord to send out laborers into the harvest. So I want you to put two and two to here together. When we pray that the Lord will send out laborers, we are actually praying that he would send us out. That is his will. Our obligation is to teach the next generation to carry on the call of Christ. If that weren't the case, then we could just get saved and Jesus could just immediately take us home. Dear Jesus, I ask you to my heart, please forgive me, I repent, I'm, you're dead and you're gone to heaven. But that's not what he does, is it? Instead, Jesus prayed for his disciples. He said, I pray that you do not, Father, I pray that you do not take them out of this world, right? But rather be with them through that world, to let them be witnesses. And that's the JMB paraphrase version right there. We must train our children in the ways of the Lord. This includes people we have led to Christ. They need to be discipled. To not care for them is as bad as giving birth to a child and then expecting that child to fend for itself. And on the flip side of that, we don't want a generation of failure to launch believers either. And that's ones that are still taking milk from a bottle when they should be eating steak and leading others to Christ. So there's a balance there. We need to be diligent in teaching our children the ways of the Lord. Teach them the fear of the Lord. Teach them to walk in his ways. Teach them to love their neighbor as themselves and teach them to love God with their all. Joshua set the example of teaching the next generation in Joshua chapter 4. He said, or Joshua chapter 4 verses 19 through 24 says, Now the people came up from the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and they camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. 
Then he spoke to the children of Israel, saying, When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord our, your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed over. That all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord, that is the mighty, um, that, it is, that it is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So Joshua had them take stones out of the middle of the Jordan and bring them over. And the stones were reminders of what the Lord had done for Israel. We set up stones of reminders when we teach and as we teach the next generation in the ways of the Lord. As we show them, as we encourage them, as we uh, correct even. We're teaching them, setting up those stones of remembrance in their lives. Just like you know different lyrics that I mentioned earlier. Just like you can pull those things out of, you can dust them off and bring them out. Those are like the, the, the remembering stones. But there's also memor- remembrance stones in the word of the Lord when we teach that next generation. Now, it is work to set up stones of remembrance. But it's well worth the effort. And I want you to also notice that the Lord actually helped them. Because they didn't have to go out in scuba gear, did did they, to get those stones? They walked out on what? Dry land. Isn't that awesome? That's so fascinating. That the Lord dried up rivers with the Red Sea at sea for the Israelites to walk over. There are rewards, and the rewards are eternal. We take the time to build up stones of remembrance by teaching the next generation. And I want to encourage you, don't be discouraged in doing good. But be encouraged, especially as we see the day approaching when we shall meet the Lord. That day is fast approaching. We can look around. You can almost read Matthew 24 like it's the front page news. That day is fast approaching when the King of kings and Lord of lords is going to split the sky and come down and call us up to meet him in the clouds. And we will forever be with him. That's good news. That's really good news. And we're going to sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb and have fellowship with one another. And there will be no sin there. I mean, there will be no hidden motives and no selfish uh, uh, gains or anything of the sort, but it'll be a perfect place where we can have a meal and sit down with the Lord in heaven. That's awesome. And then it doesn't stop there. But Jesus comes back to this earth, by the way. So this tells you right here, we aren't strumming on clouds forever in some sort of mystical la-la land type thing. But Jesus comes back to this earth, and when he sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives, bam, it splits north to south. And it causes a chasm to open up that eastern gate. And he walks through the eastern gate just like the Bible foretold. Even though the Turks in the 1500s built it all up and closed it all up and cemented it closed, that's not going to stop the King of Kings and Lord of Lords from walking through that gate because he's awesome. And he's going to set up his throne for a thousand years. And we will serve and reign with him for that thousand years. Amen. And then there's one more battle that takes place. I don't really call it that much of a battle. It's more of a God saying, all right, you're done, and everybody's out of there that's trying to fight against him. And that's when the new heavens and new earth take place. Did you catch that? New heavens and new earth? God's going to recreate everything by fire. I mean, he's going to set everything back in order and make it perfect again. And we'll have new bodies, and we can walk and and dwell with him on this earth and in the new Jerusalem that comes down. And then we can, I would imagine, go back and forth between heaven and earth. Wouldn't that be awesome now to do that? I mean, that'd be pretty cool. I'm going to go visit heaven. There I am, you know. I want to go see, you know, whatever, Paris, there I am, wherever. That's going to be awesome. It's going to be fantastic. I am way off my notes. <laughs> I guess you could tie it all back in here. We have an obligation to teach our children, whether they are, are physical or adopted or they're spiritual children that we have led to the Lord. We have an obligation to teach them the ways of the Lord, to walk in righteousness and holiness. And we have an obligation to share with them the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We have an obligation to teach them God's ways and to tell them about things to come, about the heaven to come, about the earth to come. We have that obligation. And if you're like, well, I don't know much about heaven to come, then it's time to study and dig in and find out. Find out what heaven's like. Start reading the Bible and and digging into the Word of God. Find out what's coming. Because it is coming. You see, one day there's coming a time where we won't talk about the heaven to come. Rather, we'll be dwelling in it. Amen. We have an obligation to ourselves, an obligation to our children. And also, we have an obligation to the world. Our obligation... We find this in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 18 and 20. 
Therefore, you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart, and we know how those get there, and in your soul, and bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now I want to ask you something. Who sees the doorposts and gates of your house? Whoever walks in, and those that are walking by, right? They see the, the visitors and strangers are the ones that see the doorposts and the gates of your house. Those that you let in and those who are without. And as we hide God's word in our hearts, it will come out in the needed times. And this is when the writing of the doorpost shines to the world. When they see that writing living through us. When we have written those on the doorposts of our hearts and we actually live those things out. One of the easiest ways to present the gospel is to hand out gospel tracts. I love gospel tracts. Those things are so fun to hand out. We've got a we've got a bunch of different kinds of gospel tracts here. We've got the Ten Commandments that are printed out on a, or stamped out on a penny. We've got million dollar bills. I think we've got trillion dollar bills and round to it. So, you know, when people say, well, I'll get around to it to, when, I, when I get to it, I'll get around to it to accept Christ as Savior. Well, then you can hand them a round to it and say, well, here's a round to it. Let's do it now. <laughs> Amen? All right. Well, I like that one. There's just different ways. The gospel tracts are so easy. You can leave them anywhere. You can even slide them in beer cases at the grocery store. I mean, they'll fit right in those handles. You could take the toilet paper when you're in a bathroom and you unroll it quite a bit and you take one and you roll it back up. Oh, yeah. I know it works. You can put gospel tracts anywhere. People's hands are a great place to put them too. That's an awesome place to put gospel tracts. You could take gospel tracts to the, to the world and if you're uncomfortable, see, what I like about gospel tracts is anybody can hand out a gospel tract. A two-year-old can hand out a gospel tract. A 92-year-old can hand out a gospel tract. I'll go higher because we've got higher. A 102-year-old can hand out a gospel tract. And everybody in between can hand out gospel tracts. They're wonderful tools that we can use in the ministry. Amen? <laughs> So friends, dig deep in them pockets, get those gospel tracts out and hand them out to those that you see. So one of the easiest ways. This is one form of writing his words on the doorposts of our hearts. It's a form of communication. Uh, it's a form of communicating the gospel to the lost. Those of us that support our book, Through the Dark, have been writing God's word on the doorposts of our lives and on the gates all around us. We've been writing God's words on the gates of our community for all to read. We need to do all we can while we are alive on this earth to make sure that the next generation can live in Jesus. If we won't, then who will? If we aren't willing to do it, who's going to do it? If this church won't do it, who's going to do it? Nobody else is going to. The world's not going to do it. They're not going to go hand out gospel tracts to themselves. Yes, I want to convict myself as I hand this gospel tract out. I'm going to hand out something that may offend myself. No. And by the way, you may say, well, what if we offend them by giving them a gospel tract? Where on earth are you going to offend them to? Hell number two? There is no... I mean, you can't offend them any further than where they're already going. Are you with me so far? Do you still love me? Yes. All right. It's a form of communicating the gospel to the lost. When we write the word of God on doorposts of our hearts, we're saying... This is a standard by what I will I let into the sanctity of my home as well. And I want to stop, don't meddle just for a minute. When we're talking about our home, we're talking about our hearts, amen? We talked about this earlier. We have to guard our hearts. And I'm not talking about our blood pump. Yeah, you need to take care of that. But we talk about our hearts, our souls. We need to guard our hearts with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. It is important for us to guard what we let in our eyes and ears. Listen, it affects your heart. I don't care who you are. It drops down in there and it affects you. Hollywood affects us. I mean, you may think, no, it don't, don't affect me one bit. You lie to yourself. It affects every single one of us. Hollywood is not out there to help us. Now, I'm not saying that every single movie is bad or anything like that. What I'm saying is we need to do due diligence to protect our hearts. Because of what we really need to be doing is to spend our time in the Word of God to fill it up with that so that when those time comes and we're out and about, the Lord can say, I want you to minister such and such to so-and-so right now. 
And instead of there being a fear, well, which we buffet against fear because it's a principality and power, but instead of there being a fear on the inside of us, we can fight against that natural fear and say, I refuse to be, be fearful and I'm going to do what the word of God says because he did not give me a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and a sound mind. And how do I know that? Because I've hidden it on the inside of my heart. And it's accessible for me through the power of the Holy Spirit. He brings to my remembrance those things which he has taught me. I want to read to you something that I found. It's called, Is There Hope for the Next Generation of Evan Evangelicals? It says, Russell Moore recounts a conversation with the evangelical theologian Carl Henry. As Moore and some of his friends were lamenting the miserable shape of the church, they asked Dr. Henry if he saw any hope in the coming generation of evangelicals. Dr. Henry replied, Of course there is hope for the next generation of evangelicals. But the leaders of the next generation might not be coming from the current evangelical establishment. They are probably all still, or they are probably still pagans. Who knew that Saul of Tarsus was to be a great apostle to the Gentiles? Who knew that God would raise up C.S. Lewis or, or Chuck Colson? They all were unbelievers who, once saved by the grace of God, were mighty warriors for the faith. Russell Moore added, "The next Jonathan Edwards might be a man driving in front of you with a Darwin Fish bumper decal." The next Charles Wesley might be a um, synergist, profane hip-hop artist now. The next Billy Graham might be passed out drunk in a fraternity house right now. The next Charles Spurgeon might be making posters for Gay Pride March right now. The next Mother Teresa might be managing an abort abortion clinic right now. And I want to tell you this, that as long as there is life in the church, there is hope for the next generation. But we've got to be willing to live that life. We've got to be willing to get out there and minister to the lost. Instead of being, being offended that they're laying there drunk, instead help them up and start ministering the gospel to them. Instead of being offended that they're flirting that dumb Darwin stumper, bumper, st stumper picker, a, a bumper sticker, thank you, Harold. Um, minister to them and, and engage them in conversation. Love on them. Show them the love of Christ that we have dwelling on the inside of us. If the first thing out of our mouths is, you're stupid for believing in that, that is not the love of Christ coming out. All right? That may be true, but it's not the love of Christ coming out of our mouths. We need to let the love of Christ overflow our souls to minister to that lost because they may be the next Billy Graham. They may be the next Charles Spurgeon, whoever, the, the Chuck Colson or C.S. Lewis. But we've got to do something. We don't want to just sit here, but we've got to do something. As long as there is life in the church, there is hope for the next generation. We have to be willing to minister to them. We have an obligation to ourselves. We have an obligation to our children. We have an obligation to the world. And finally, we have an obligation to the Lord. And some of your ears just slid forward three quarters of an inch when you heard me say the word finally. Because this is the last point in the sermon this morning. Our obligation to the Lord. We need to teach the next generation to invite the Lord to church. We have the ability to ask the Lord to be in our midst. Matthew 18, 19 and 20 says, Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Teach the next generation about asking. Listen, asking is a key to the kingdom of heaven. You have not because you ask not. Or you have not because you ask amiss. We need to understand proper asking of the Lord. We set the example through regular prayer. We need to teach the next generation about gathering in the name of Jesus. One of the ways we do this is by showing them the importance of being at church on a regular basis. And another way is, is setting the example of service. We can ask the Lord to show up at church and set the example by being there as well. We need to teach the next generation to expect the Lord to be here. I'm going to say this. Church is so much more exciting when the presence of the Lord is here. I love it when he shows up. Sometimes, sometimes I'm just, I, mean, I just want to jump up and down. You know, I, I'm just so excited he's here. Other times I feel like I'm just going to explode and be like, Pastor Jason pieces all over the place. Other times I become a weepy mess, you know, where he's just ministering to me and I'm enjoying and loving on him. Other times there's just a calmness and a quietness that comes over me. But I love it every single time that the Lord shows up. 
I love it when his precious Holy Spirit comes in this place. I love it when he ministers. I just love it. We need to teach the next generation to expect the Lord to be here. Show them your excitement. Be so excited you just can't hide it. Teach the next generation to revere the presence of the Lord. Because when we invite him and expect him to show up, he will. But when he's here, we also need to honor the creator of the universe in all reverence and fear. Because he is holy and worthy of all our praise. And I know that there are times where we can shout out loud. It's like being in a stadium. And I, I love those times. And other times there's just a, a, a fear that can come. I remember uh, an accountant, my father-in-law, before he passed away, he told the family. He was in a service and the presence of the Lord showed up so strong. A fear of the Lord came upon him and he thought, if I move one muscle right now, I'm a dead man. That's how strong the presence of the Lord was in that place. Now, do I believe the Lord would have just killed him on the spot? No. But there was a honor. There was a, a honor and a reverence for the Lord at that time and that's how it manifested itself. Now, there have been other times where just, you, know, you get a Holy Ghost run going and do a lap around the auditorium or whatever. There's different ways that we honor the Lord and revere Him as well. He is holy and worthy of all our praise. I have a question for you this morning. After listening to all this, can we commit together as a church to train up the next generation in the ways of the Lord on purpose? I'm reminded of a story of a, a lady who was offended at her pastor. Not at her pastor, at her church. She was offended at people in the church. She went to the pastor and she said, I'm just offended. There's people gossiping. There's people backbiting. I'm just tired of this place. Um, you know, people aren't doing what they need to be doing and I'm going to leave this church and the pastor said well before you do I'd like for you to take this cup of water and walk around the church one, at least one lap and come back to me but you can't spill a drop of it she said okay so she grabbed that cup of water and began walking with that cup of water and she walked all the way around the church and she got back to the pastor's office and she said here's the cup of water back and he asked her he said now when you were walking around the church with that cup of water, did you hear any backbiting? She said, no. He said, did you hear any gossiping? She said, no. He said, were you offended at anybody, anything was saying or doing? She said, no, I was too concentrated on the cup full of water. He said, exactly. When we can concentrate on what the Lord has called us to do, then we can start wa walking and working in unity to accomplish the things that he wants done. So instead of focusing in on the negative, we start focusing in on what God has called us to do. And it'll quell those bad things. It'll start quenching and creating unity instead of division. Are you with me? Would you please stand with me this morning? I'd like everybody to close your eyes and bow your heads. Would you commit with me this morning to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit? To be sensitive to the people we're ministering to and to be good vessels for the glory of the Lord? Would you commit with me this morning to train up the next generation? Father, we come before you this morning. We humble ourselves and we ask for your will to be accomplished we ask that you would use us for your glory to minister to those that are lost those that are hurting Lord I pray that you would use us to minister to those within our walls as well Lord you know every need in this place you know the hurts that are taking place you know the struggles you know the issues at the jobs you know family issues you know friend issues you know it all and God, I'm asking that you give each and every one of us wisdom in dealing with different situations to minister to those that are hurting around us. We submit ourselves to you. 
to be used by you. And Lord, would you forgive us of concentrating on the negative things and help us to concentrate on the things that you would have us to do. Help us to concentrate on not dropping that water, not spilling a drop. Help us to concentrate on your will to be accomplished. Help us to concentrate on ministering with the Holy Spirit to minister to those that need help. Please use us for your glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Would you have a seat just for one more minute? We've got a couple of announcements to, to take care of. Um, those of you who already know that uh, Tuesday uh, evening, we had... Um, somebody decided to go ahead and help themselves to our brand new lawnmower uh, out back. So we're going to be praying that uh, they get saved and God calls them to the hottest part of Africa. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I do pray that they get saved and repent, but so we did have that happen. That was one of the issues there, one of, or something that happened uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. I came in and I was uh, fascinated by the, the, the little uh, speed limit flashy thing out here. I pulled in the parking lot. I just sat there. I was early, and I sat there for a few minutes watching to see how fast people were coming down Alice Drive. One hit 50. I was like, oh, yeah. Little red and blue lights came on, and I went to go put trash away and saw that it was open and realized that we had an issue there because they don't normally cut the lawn on Wednesdays. So um, we did lose that. The insurance is going to help us out in that area. Also, and, and more importantly, um, we have enjoyed the presence of the Bagwells for the last three and a half years. They have been a blessing to our church. And their last Sunday is next week. Next week is their last Sunday with us. And we have loved them and, and appreciate them very much. The Lord has called them into a new direction in their lives. So what we're going to do is next week, we're going to have a special presentation for them at the end of service. So we want you to be here for that as we bless them on their way and their new journey. Amen. Would you please stand with me one more time? Appreciate everybody coming out this morning. Uh, we love you. I'm going to stay at the front here at the altar. If you need prayer for anything uh, or if, you know, if, uh, whatever you need, I'm up here at the front. And you are dismissed. We will see you this evening at 6 o'clock.